Um, okay, guys, I'm going to go ahead and get started because I don't want to cut in too much on our uh, Dr. King's lecture time. Um, welcome to the 29th annual Mary George Lectureship. Uh, this was founded in 29 years ago. <laughs> 29 years ago by Dr. Ronald B. George, who is sitting right here today. Um, to honor one of the founders of our medical school, uh, Dr. George Manili. Uh, probably none of you knew Dr. Manili, except maybe Drs. Muslow, okay, except maybe four or five of you. Uh, Dr. Manili was a, an amazing individual. He was a physiologist, he was a cardiologist, he was a pulmonologist, he invented the helium dilution method for measuring lung volume. Uh, he was an architect. Um, he, he had a long and distinguished career in, medical field um, and was really an instrumental power in the founding of this institution today. So we honor him with this lectureship. It was renamed a few years ago also with uh, Dr. Ronald B. George, who was responsible for founding the Pulmonary Critical Care Division in 1972. We were counting the other day, Vicki and I, our wonderful secretary, there have been over a hundred fellows trained in that division since 1972. So all the care around here in pulmonary critical care uh, is almost certainly from one of our graduates who's been on the faculty or from one of the uh, fellows. And we have them scattered out from Hawaii to Virginia Beach. So it's an amazing thing you've done, Ronnie. And we honor you today in the Manili George Lectureship. Now I am just, um, I can hardly stand it. Um, I'm so excited to have Dr. Talmadge King here today. We had a wonderful dinner last night, and we had a meeting this morning over coffee with a lot of our fellows. He obviously enjoys young people just starting out in medicine, just starting out in pulmonary critical care. He had, we had some great case discussions and just general advice. He is the chairman of medicine at the University of California in San Francisco. Um, he is maybe the premier expert in the world on IPF. Now, what does that mean to you? That means when you go to UpToDate, which is where you get all your information on it, he wrote that, okay? All the things on IPF, he wrote that. Now, you probably aren't gonna read his best-selling book, Interstitial Lung Disease, now in his fifth edition, but if you go into pulmonary and critical care, you probably will have a copy. Um, Dr. King uh, was uh, raised in Georgia, uh, but then matriculated through the system and went to Harvard Medical School um, and then did his residency in internal medicine at Emory in Atlanta before going west uh, to Denver to do his uh, pulmonary critical care. Um, and then eventually he was National Jewish for some time uh, on the faculty there and then uh, has been uh, at the University of California, San Francisco for 10 or 15 years. Uh, where he uh, is now chairman of medicine at that really distinguished place. He uh, has an incredibly long CD, as you imagine. He's been well funded in the field of interstitial lung disease. Um, he's been president of the ATS. He's won the Trudeau Medal, which is the highest award given by the ATS. He's well known all over the world. And I'm so thrilled that he's here today to bring you the gospel of IPF because there's actually some things we can do about it. Okay, there's some new drugs that have been approved. I'm sure he's going to talk about some of those. He actually was the first author on the New England Journal of Medical Society, May 29th, looking at uh, one of those drugs. And so you'll get to hear the latest on IPF uh, uh, from Dr. Talmadge King. Thank you so much for coming. So good afternoon. I think this is... Uh the mic is on. Is the mic on? Can you hear me now? Okay. Can you hear that? So yeah. So um, so thank you all for coming to, to Grand Rounds, and uh, I Keith, thank you very much for inviting me. It was nice to be here. Um, my first trip here. Uh, it's been really fun so far. I enjoyed uh, meeting everybody and talking to people about medicine and politics and the weather and you know. <laughs> That stupid play at the end of the Super Bowl. <laughs> it's like, uh, I don't like either team so fine. Uh, but I, I definitely don't like New England Patriots. I'm a AFC fan. I'm a 
Denver Bronco fan, so uh, die-hard Denver Bronco fan. So seeing Tom Brady win another one is sort of crushing, but uh, uh, we'll, we'll live with it. Today I'd like to talk about uh, interstitial lung disease, and in particular idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. So how did I get interested in this? Well, so I was a fellow at, in Colorado, and I was at uh, Rose Medical Center, um, a first-year fellow, and it was around it was a, right before Christmas, if I remember right. And um, I had a patient come in, Maria Mejia. Um, she was 37 or 38 years old. She had five children. She had been very healthy all of her life, according to her. But when you talk to her, it turns out she had had a few things that had happened to her. Um, and she had sort of ignored those things because she's a mother trying to take care of her family. She had Raynaud's. Um, she had had um, some vague arthritis, and she came in very, very short of breath. And according to her, she was short of breath. It, it would, came on relatively suddenly. It, it, the more you talk to her and talking to her kids, they had noticed that she had become a little bit more fatigued. It wasn't sort of the same as usual. But over a, a day or so, she got rapidly worse and actually <coughs> went from being moderately short of breath with some, change, some mild uh, interstitial opacities on her chest x-ray to a complete whiteout of her chest x-ray. Was intubated, ventilated, and died. All within a period of about a week or 10 days in the hospital. And I distinctly remember standing at her bedside trying to figure out what in the world was this? We went through, we thought she had ARDS. Um, we went through that whole protocol and decided that uh, this was probably some form of ARDS, but um, she, after her death, she actually had an autopsy. And she had, and, and as we worked her up, she, it turned out she had acute lupus pneumonitis. And her first manifestation really, she'd had the right nose, but her first manifestation was the development of this rapidly progressive disease that at that time we were calling ham and rich, but it, it, we later called it acute lupus pneumonitis is diffuse alveolar damage in the lung. And I, I got interested in what is this and how, what, why did this happen to this woman? She, was, she seemed like such a sweet lady I, I, uh, and, and remember talking to our kids and I said, I want to learn more about this. So I went to the literature to try to learn about uh, acute lung injury in this setting, certainly the setting of a connective tissue disease. So I got started off thinking that I would be interested in trying to understand lung diseases associated with connective tissue disease. I happened to be at, at the University of Colorado and uh, I got to work with uh, Marvin Swartz and Bob Dreisen, who were clinicians, pulmonologists, who were interested in diffuse lung disease. And they were just beginning to get interested in that entity. And then I spent a couple of years in the lab working uh, on animal models of, of, of lung injury and wanted to try to develop an animal model for uh, chronic interstitial lung disease, um, and I worked with Peter Henson, a PhD, who was interested in inflammation. And so I worked in the lab for a couple of years, and um, just to show you how your career changes. So I, I was a fellow, they gave me a faculty job, I started off running the ICU at the VA, um, and, about, uh, and then I was do doing research at the same time, I was doing research uh, on, as I just described, trying to, trying to learn more about interstitial lung disease. And so I started working with rabbits and I was interested in complement in the lung. It turns out nobody understood complement. That was right when bronchoveal lavage came around. So we started washing the lungs of rabbits and I wanted to study what happens to complement in the lung. I can't, t I used to know the complement cascade inside, up, backwards, forward. I don't even know what it is now. I've, I've suppressed all of that. <laughs> But I worked in the lab, and I did that for um, two or three years. And one day I went in the lab, and um, my column overflowed. And we had killed a ton of rabbits to get to this big experiment that we were doing, and the column overflowed. So I walked in the lab, saw the stuff on the floor, turned around, walked out, went to Peter Henson's office, and said, I quit. <laughs> And I, I'm like, this is not for me. I, I, first of all, I love seeing patients. I want to do patient-related research. Um, 
So I said, I, I, I just can't stand this. And he said, oh, well, okay, Talmadge. He said, what, what, what would you like to do? And I said, well, I'd rather work with patients. He said, well, we got a good job for you. We, we're looking for somebody to, to develop an interstitial lung disease program. So being in the right place at the right time, that being sort of my interest anyway, I started working with Marvin Schwartz and Bob Dreisen. And we formed the first sort of interstitial lung disease clinic. And the rest, as they say, is history. Except there was one thing that always bothered me about that history. When I went in and talked to Peter Henson, I, you know, I'm, I'm a good fellow. And I was doing really well. And I thought I was fairly good at this research. And it seemed like he should have encouraged me to hang on, huh? He didn't. So I accused him of knowing that I wasn't good at this. And he wasn't telling me I wasn't good at this. So when he saw the opening that he could direct me to something else, he took advantage and he pushed me into this other thing. So, uh, so but I actually appreciated the fact that he listened to me and he actually did direct me into a career that I have found just fascinating. And actually what I'm gonna do today is actually we talk, walk you through that career um, and what has happened and what, how we've gotten to where we are today. It's been a, a wonderful career. And, I, and I'm gonna start by, these are my, I'm so conflicted, I'm not conflicted. Um, so these are, these are my, uh, so I'm going to start by telling you about another case and use this case as the backdrop. 60-year-old man who was a uh, college professor at Berkeley. He was short of breath. He had a dry cough and throat clearing. Uh, his history, looking at his occupational environmental history, in his 20s he had done some, he spent a couple of summers uh, in the shipyard. He doesn't remember what he did. And within the last five years, he had remodeled his home, and he did a lot of the remodeling himself. His past medical history was he was a former smoker. He quit 10 years ago because his family was on him about smoking. Um, and he had coronary artery disease, high blood pressure, chronic nasal congestion. He had gastroesophageal reflux disease. Family history was negative for any lung disease, and he was on these medicines uh, for his blood pressure for his, for his gastroesophageal reflux disease. And he was taking uh, inhalers for his lung disease because he was short of breath. He didn't have actually asthma. His physical exam was relatively unremarkable. He had a respiratory rate of 14. He had crackles at the bases. Um, and his oxygen saturation was normal at rest. And when he exercised, just walking in the hallway, his saturation fell to 90. So, so he looked fine, but looking at these numbers, he was a lot worse uh, than, than we thought. There's some respiratory therapy students in here. So one of, the, one of, my, one of my pet peeves is, is I walk into the wards and, the, and I look at the patient's chart, and the respiratory rate is 18. You know what that tells me? You, did, you didn't count it, right? You didn't count it, because your normal respiratory rate is what? what? Everybody's sitting in this room. What's your, what's your normal respiratory rate? This is about 8 to 12, right? So when I walk to the chart, and if it says, eight, I know you probably didn't even look at the patient, right? Because if it is 18, I'm worried, right? I should be worried. If it's 24, then maybe I think you counted it, and, and I, you know, I'm, now I'm definitely worried, right? But people, don't dry lab it. Go and count the rest of her rate, because it actually matters, OK? Um, so anyway, he was 14. So I wasn't really worried at rest. But when we exercised him, it was awful. And the chest x-ray, bilateral lower lung zone, reticular opacities, um, CT scan, one slice from the CT scan just doesn't project very well. But mid to lower lung zone, reticular opacities that are subpleural, and he has tiny little cysts, you can't see them well, here, here. Um, so called honeycombing, uh, without any other abnormalities. So this looks like a patient has a UIP pattern on HRCT in the right clinical setting. So we, we think that this is probably idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. But I go back to this history, and there are other things I should actually worry about here. So what, what are other things I should worry about, just given the history? 
So somebody says hypersensitivity and pneumonitis. So you're thinking, what of this? So you have, you have to ask them, why were they remodeling the house? So was there water damage in the house? And now you have mold and mildew, and, there, and he's actually been breathing in these organisms and now has developed a chronic hypersensitivity and pneumonitis. What about that one? Asbestos. So he could have been an as, asbestos filter for a couple of summers, right? Mixing it himself. He's old enough that he could have worked with raw asbestos. And no, that brief exposure could have caused the disease many, many years later. So that bothers you. What about this one? It turns out a large number of patients with lung disease in general have GERD. We're, we're finding that it's, it's very, very common with the patients with initial lung disease. And we worry now that, that it may be a, a predisposing factor to development of some of these fibrotic diseases, uh, and particularly IPF, that you have gastroesophageal reflux and you actually have micro aspirations that you don't recognize. Turns out when we talk to patients, we find that they cough a lot at night. And then you talk to them more and you find the, the disease looks a little bit asymmetric on the chest x-ray or CT scan, and they sleep with that side, the bad side down. And you ask the wife, and so we're very worried about this, Joyce Lee, who works with us, We've been trying to figure out what is, what, you know, whether GERD causes the problem. And we've been studying our IPF patients without symptoms. And almost all of them have GERD and it's usually very bad. No symptoms. They just have really bad GERD. So we are worried about this as a potential etiology. What about smoking? Well, there are lots of different smoking-related interstitial lung disease. The most common is respiratory bronchiolitis. So he's got a lot of things going on we have to try to decipher. Um, he had lung function tests done, his baseline lung function two years before. Not sure why he, he, why he had it two years ago. He had some kind of lung problem, he went in, and it looked like a restrictive pattern, FEV1 to FEC ratio above 80%. So that tends toward restriction. Total lung capacity confirmed that. It was 60% of, of predicted. And his gas exchange looked abnormal. His diffusing capacity was 60% of predicted. Then two years later, this was done in our lab. All of this had gotten a little worse. So interstitial lung disease on test x-ray, looks like IPF, restrictive physiology with gas exchange abnormalities, shown both by walk oximetry and by DLCO. Uh, if you measured his blood gases, I'm sure it was that. We actually did a biopsy in him. He had UIP, and it progressed, and he uh, died within two years of that, of our uh, initial visit. So that's actually, a, a, to me, is a classic sort of case of idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, middle-aged man, former smoker uh, with progressive disease. So IPF is one of the diffuse parenchymal lung diseases or interstitial lung disease, which is a heterogeneous group of non-infectious, non-malignant processes of the lower respiratory tract. Symptoms of dyspnea and cough. The signs are mainly crackles. You can get clubbing with advanced disease. And you have the pattern that, the, that he showed restriction on lung, lung function, interstitial opacities on x-ray. The biopsy in this setting generally shows two big patterns. This is a gross over, oversimplification, but you usually have a granulobinous pattern that actually drives you down a certain set of diseases like sarcoidosis or hypersensitivity pneumonitis, and an inflammatory fibrotic pattern, and everything has that. So that list is actually long and difficult to decipher, um, but the biopsy can be very helpful and often these diseases are progressive and fatal. We've thought about them, and there are 200 to 300 entities where lung fibrosis can occur, interstitial lung disease can occur. We've thought about them in this way. You can think about it several different ways. Those of known etiology in red, there are 100 plus drugs where, but usually they're chemotherapeutic agents. We know the patients on the drug and uh, for the treatment of their cancer, and then they develop uh, interstitial lung disease as a result of it. You know, methotrexate, um, uh, uh, busulfan, a number of drugs are known to be causes of uh, interstitial lung disease. There's a really nice uh, website called Pneumotox. If you, have, uh, if you don't know the, uh, the drug side effects, you can go to Pneumotox, plug in the drug, and you can find any paper that's ever been written about uh, interstitial lung disease in that setting. Uh, it's a very useful, and it's an app on your iPhone now. There are occupational environmental exposures. Uh, and so you, there are many, many different causes. Every year there's a, uh, or two, there's a new one. Um, and so you have to actually um, 
look at that. His exposure to asbestos was good, is possible. His exposure in his home to mold or fungi is possible. Um, and if there's a bird in the in the vicinity, I say kill the bird because <laughs> you know it, the bird can be alive or dead. The bird bird fanciers disease is really really common. The bird fanciers know it. It's written in their literature. I mean, if you got you buy a bird and you really own a bird and you read about it. One of the first things you're going to read is that this, the exposure to the birds can cause interstitial lung disease. I've had patients come in, they'll lie about the bird. They, you know, they, I mean, it's the same as about the cat, and they, and they, they lie about the cat. And, um, and so you have to ask, ask several people about the bird. I mean, and it, it, these are the best stories I've ever had in medicine, have been my cat stories and my bird stories. So I have to tell you one bird story. So, <laughs> So the guy comes in and go through the workup and get him all settled. And we were at the final interview and I'm telling him, you know, the results of the test. And we did a biopsy. And I said, well, you have granulomatous inflammation on your biopsy and it looks like you have hypersensitivity pneumonitis. So the guy turns to his wife and says, honey, Dr. King says I have hypersensitivity pneumonitis. Turns back to me and says, well, what should we do about that? And I said, well, you know, it's, uh, we, we often, We'll treat it with steroids, but the first thing you should do is get rid of the bird. She said, honey, Dr. King said we should get rid of the bird. A millisecond pass, a fraction of a millisecond pass, before she said, that depends on whether we decide to keep you. <laughs> <laughs> and I looked at, I must have had a look on my, I can't play poker, right? I, I must have had a look on my face. And she says, oh, Dr. King, you don't understand. I said, mm, uh, no problem. I'm just here to try to help you. You know, I, you know, I, I'm, I, you know she says, she says you, you, you probably think I'm a bad person. And I'm not being judgmental. No, ma'am. I'm just, you know, we're just, let's just, we just have this conversation. She said, well, you think, uh, he said, you think I'm easy, but he's the only person that loves me. I'm like, he who? <laughs> <laughs> and she said, whatever, Alex or something, or like, said, whatever his name was, I said, I couldn't resist. I said, tell me how does, I said, what did I say? He, I said, he pays the rent. How does Alex show, express his love, you know? She said, well, he says, you're beautiful, I love you, and some one third thing. A millisecond later, I turned to the guy and said, listen, buddy, you better learn those three phrases and you better use them all. <laughs> they kept, they built, I swear to God, they built a room for the bird <laughs> so they could keep him. Right? So idiopathic interstitial pneumonias is what I'm going to talk about. IPF is in that category, a chronic fibrosing lung disease. There are acute ones like Maria Mejia had acute interstitial pneumonia. She died, she died of lupus pneumonitis. And there are smoking related ones, respiratory bronchiolitis, desquamative interstitial lung disease. There's also something called Langerhans cell granulomatosis, which is a smoking related interstitial lung disease. It takes a village to make this diagnosis. Uh, primary care doctor usually is the first point of contact. Often they stay there for two years before it becomes clear that they have a problem other than you know, COPD or asthma. Uh, and then they seek additional attention as they become more symptomatic. Um, see the pulmonologist, we involve rheumatologists in, our, in these evaluations, radiologists and pathologists, depending on the workup that happens as it proceeds along. But it really can be difficult to make a diagnosis alone. IPF is the disease he had. It's a specific form of chronic prog progressive fibrosing pneumonia, unknown cause occurs in adults, mostly between the ages of 55 and 75. The majority are over the age of 65. Um, and it's associated with this UIP pattern, which is uh, what I'll show you more in a, minute, in a minute. The disease seems to occur, the incidence is greatest in people over the age of 50, uh, men and women. Um, and the prevalence increases with age, particularly over the age of 50, uh, men and women. There would be more people in the prevalence, but the disease causes, the death rate is so high. So it's a, there are about 50 to 100,000 people in the U.S. with the disease at any given time. But it's a disease of older people. It causes lung restriction. So here's a flow volume curve. This is what the patient should normally take a big breath and blow it out. This is what it should look like. At this patient, uh, 
at any given lung volume, flows are high. The lungs stiff. Take a big breath, blow it out. You can blow the air out. You can't, blow, can't take the air in. The opposite of emphysema, lung is big and baggy. Take a big breath. You can't blow the air out. So this is, instead of an obstructive disease where you can't get air out, this is a restrictive disease where you can't get air in. The reason it's restrictive is because the lung is stiff. This is called a pressure volume curve. So you measure pressure and volume should be in this range, and you can see the patients took a lot of pressure to get their lung to about 60% of total lung capacity. The opposite occurs in emphysema, big baggy lung, uh, easy to get air in, but not get air out. So increased elastic recoil, uh, increased flows at any given lung volume. With exercise, normally with exercise, your saturation should stay the same or get better. In this patient, you can see the saturation fell, like our, like our example of professor, and usually the AA gradient goes up, the blood oxygen falls, the saturation falls as a result, and the ventilation increases dramatically, so the minute ventilation dramatically increases, but you're still not able to oxygenate your blood. So that's a classic pattern that occurs in this setting. The chest x-ray is not so helpful. Um, we, we spent a lot of time talking about the chest x-ray over many years. We can often come to some general conclusion, but Life didn't change for us until high-res CT came along, and high-res CT is a technique where you do thin sections, one to one and a half millimeter sections of the lung, and, and, you, and you get this uh, high-res CT scan. We often do supine, prone, and expiratory images. Um, and once we did CT, it completely changed how we could evaluate the lung, because it, it, it's almost like looking at the lung itself. You can, with the newer techniques, you can pretty much reconstruct the lung and turn it around and look at it upside down and multiple different slices. And so high res has completely changed our diagnosis of interstitial lung diseases because the pattern of abnormality may suggest a specific lung disease. It can guide diagnostic testing. And in the right setting, it can be diagnostic itself. You can say this is this, is this disease. The key features you look for are reticulation. So basically shadows that are subplural that are basically densities at the, at the periphery of the lung. This one shows some honeycombing as well. So thickening of the inter and interlobular septa is reticulation. You can get ground glass opacity. So you can see the underlying structure, but there's this hazy gray. So is this abnormal or is this abnormal? It turns out in this picture, the white stuff is abnormal. So the hazy gray ground glass, that is a nonspecific finding. You can see it in a lot of different settings. So those, the HRCT pattern of UIP, is this is a slide I showed you earlier with the subpleural disease, but the key finding uh, is honeycombing. So we are very strict about how we think of honeycombing. So usually there are two rows, there's a row, one row of tiny little holes in the lung, and then they're usually stacked on in other little holes, and this person had quite a bit of honeycombing. If you only saw this, you have to be careful. There's just one row of holes, um, but this one, where there's several clustered together or here, helps you, you can be confident that if you biopsy that, that will be honeycombing. And in the right setting, that's very diagnostic of ILD. The other pattern we call nonspecific interstitial pneumonia pattern. This is a hard, more difficult pattern to recognize, but it, you get ground glass or consolidation that is subplural, but you get this very, very interesting um, area where there seems to be no disease right next to the pleura. Um, so here is, is a dense consolidation next to the pleura. But that's characteristic. It's characteristic but very rarely seen. Um, but it's in the same place as UIP, but the disease is different. There's traction bronchiectasis. So this is not honeycomb, it's just severe traction bronchiectasis in the lower lung zone. Um, here is this, all of that's traction bronchiectasis, it's not honeycombing. But again, this sort of interesting sparing right next to the pleura, whereas in the UIP pattern, the disease is right next to the pleura. So uh, in this pattern, uh, we see more and more. The histopathologic pattern is a normal lung. This is a patient who died of lung fibrosis. So this is severe disease at the periphery of the lung. So it's at the periphery of the lung, it's worse at the bottom, it's worse from the bottom up. So it's outside in, bottom up, and you can see the holes in the lung, so there's honeycombing here. Uh, and that's classic for idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. So here's with a naked eye, a biopsy, the lung the disease at the periphery of this biopsy, higher power, you can see it's at the periphery, intervening normal lung, 
but this is also septal. And then you see these very characteristic things called fibroblastic foci. This is the money part of this injury. So there's ongoing fibrosis scarring right next to dense scar. And you end up, this is a gross picture. You can see the cobblestoning pattern of the surface of the lung and the holes in the lung. So it goes from outside in, destroying the lung. And the honeycomb lung is what you end up with. That's the UIP pattern. So the clinical course of IPF is variable and may be difficult to predict. So generally, we think of the onset of symptoms and there's slow progression over time. The majority of patients follow this pattern. But you can have comorbidities like emphysema or pulmonary hypertension. A few people have rapidly progressive disease. But we think of this slow progression over time uh, with, a fault, with a decreased survival over time based on the severity of your lung disease. Uh, occasionally, you can have these acute lung injury patterns, what we call acute exacerbations. It's very unusual for a patient to survive an acute exacerbation. They can have more, more than one, but usually you have one, and within 30 days of that acute exacerbation, that is, you get you have chronic lung disease, you get a new onset, acute lung injury, uh, diffuse alveolar damage in the lung, and usually the patient dies after that event. Um, the big problem for us is we know that there's this quiet zone when people have injury because we can get an x-ray and we can see things there and the patient's asymptomatic. We, ha we don't understand this period very well uh, and we're trying very hard nowadays since we have CT scans being done so more, much more frequently. We are trying to study people with early disease before the onset of symptoms. We think this occurs between two to five years before their symptoms, but it's really hard to figure that out. But the course is generally one of slow progression. So why did it take us so long to get to a, a place where we had uh, better therapy? Part of it was what we thought about disease. So when I first started back in the lab when, we, when I was doing the rabbits, we thought of interstitial lung disease as an inflammatory process. You had inflammation, inflammation, inflammation then led to scarring. That is absolutely true in many of the interstitial lung disease. Inflammation leads to scarring. But in IPF, it's pretty clear that that is not the primary process. Um, that in fact, we, we, it's a fibroproliferative process that's preceded by epithelial activation. It's, in fact, it's a form of abnormal wound healing in the lung. So the, what happens is you, you can see inflammation in the lung, but what really is going on is you get these fibroblastic proliferations in the lung, and the fibroblasts lay down collagen. So these are active uh, fibroblasts, the blue, and it's laying down collagen seen here in yellow, and it just slowly progresses and it destroys the lung. And that fibro, we've now shown that the number of fibroblastic foci in your lung predicts your long-term survival because that's the site of ongoing injury and in repair in the lung. And so we changed from thinking that it's inflammation to fibrosis to thinking that it's epithelial injury then the, there's the development of a fibroblast, fibroblastic foci, and for whatever reason, the fibroblasts become immortal. They just keep going and going and going, and they destroy the lung. Once we changed that thought process and started thinking about it differently, we went from looking to, for agents that block inflammation to agents that block fibrosis. And we also know age is, some, is, a, pro, is a factor in this disease. Remember I said that they, they, most of the patients are over the age of 50, mostly over the age of 65. So we know that aging causes a failure of the alveolar epithelium. And so there's something to do with aging that we're trying to understand. There's no cure for IPF. Even with the new drugs, there's no cure. We, can, we basically can slow the progression. And so for me, a big day in my career was October 15, 2014 when we had uh, approved by the FDA two drugs that can be used to manage this disease. Perfenidone, uh, Espria, uh, and Ofeb, or Nitetinib. Um, these two drugs, they have very different mechanisms of action, um, and they, they slow progression of disease. We'll talk about this. So the reason it took us so long to get here, the first was, remember I started looking at animal models. None of the animal models that we developed look like UIP. Um, and so because uh, we studied mostly mice, um, and mice are not men, and the injury that actually occurs in mice does not, does not look in any way like the disease that occurs in humans. And we used the bleomycin model to learn a lot of things about inflammatory lung disease 
but it didn't help us learn a lot about fibrotic lung disease. So we've had to do translational research. We had to do research in human beings, um, and that's just more difficult. The life for us in this field changed dramatically when the NIH decided to fund the Panther trials, or IPF net, which are 26 medical centers across the U.S. who were interested in this disease, and we studied IPF. Um, and when that came about, a lot more people were able to gather together, and because we collectively were seeing small numbers of patients, when we worked together, we started seeing much larger numbers of patients. And we could prove that we could do these multi-center trials. The other thing that confused us was we treated patients with anti-inflammatory agents, and it looked like it worked. Um, so we, we used steroids. I used to use steroids in very, very high doses. That's another story I'll save to another time, but to tell you why we started using it in high dose. But we, the rationale was to treat inflammation, that we would slow fibroblastic proliferation, and we would prevent irreversible fibrosis. And we conveniently ignored all the side effects. I mean, we knew that they were there and they were bad. Part of the reason there was a problem is when we looked at the interstitial lung diseases, there are many of them that are quite steroid responsive. I just showed you a list here of lymphocytic interstitial pneumonia, eosinophilic pneumonia, uh, DIP, organizing pneumonia. Um, there's some that tend to have some response, we think, to steroids like diffuse alveolar damage, maybe, diffuse alveolar hemorrhage, maybe. And then there's the others, like UIP, that occurs in IPF, that, has, that doesn't respond to steroids. But because some did, and people wanted to do something, they, we used steroids. They said, you have to give them something, um, which is another one of my pet peeves. You know, you know that no therapy is a therapy if it's used in the right setting? I mean, that's why I believe in placebo. So my, my, if I have to have a bad disease and I have to get in a clinical trial, I want to get in a clinical trial that absolutely works, and I want to be in the placebo group. Okay? Because the placebo group will do fine. It always does better than the historical controls. Placebo group will fine. And I want to survive long enough to see if the drug works, then I want to roll over into the new drug. Right? <laughs> right? <laughs> Don't you think that's pretty rational? <laughs> right? Well, uh, and, and then you only want to use the drug the first five years, because you know that's, it stops working after five years. Y'all ever pay attention to that? You know, I used to always read the Annals of Internal Medicine five years later. They used to have that uh, series in the Annals, the, so a couple of guys my age, you know, younger than me, but you remember, right? <laughs> I used to wait for them, because five years later, it worked for five years, and now that drug is gone, right? So, <laughs> uh, you want to use it early. Uh, but, but this, but people, I, well, I tell my residents all the time, you, it's just like using antibiotics to treat a common cold. Why in the world do we do that? And people say, well, I have to give them something. The patient wants something. The patient wants your advice. Tell them it doesn't work. They say, well, they'll go to somebody else and get them. Let them go to that nut, you know? <laughs> but don't, you don't have to actually give them antibiotics. It doesn't work, right? Patients email me this morning. She, she says, well, you know, I got a Z pack and it's working. I, I'm sure it was a virus, but I took that Z pack. And I'm like, okay, fine. When you get your vaginitis, don't call me. You know? <laughs> so we, the other thing we did is we overvalued, underpowered, poorly designed studies. So there were all these studies. I was part of them where we did, we, we looked at prednisone and azathioprine, very small studies. It looked like the drugs worked. Um, but, and so because we had nothing, patients were dying. We actually tried these things, so we used these high, high, very powerful drugs. Cyclophosphamide appeared to work with prednisone. Very small study. The p-value was non-significant, but this drove what we did for a long time. And then once we decided, well, let's look and see if we can tell if it works or not. So Hal Collard worked. He was a fellow then. We worked with Jay Rue at Mayo Clinic. At the Mayo Clinic, they had a lot of patients that had never given them anything, right? because they didn't think the steroids worked, and they, and they thought that no therapy was better than, the, than giving them the side effects of treatment. So we looked at the Mayo Clinic untreated versus those patients that we were seeing. Steroids were in the water at National Jewish, so everybody got steroids. Um, but we treated with steroids and cyclophosphamide, and you can see when you look at survival curve compared to expected, there was no difference treated untreated. So we were getting evidence fairly early that in patients with IPF, the drug wasn't working. 
Um, we ignored the widely recognized adverse events that occurred. Um, so people were commonly using, so when we interviewed doctors across, the pulmonologists across the U.S., most were using prednisone, prednisone is an aid as diaphragm, prednisone is a cycloc cy cytoxan, this is in 2007, 2008, prednisone, azathioprine, NAC. These were the drugs that were being commonly used for mild or advanced IPF. So we were using drugs that had very little information. The other thing that was a problem is we couldn't agree on the disease definition. Uh, and this all changed in 2000, around 2000, it was 1998 to 2000, when we got an international group of people together to actually decide what are we talking about when we talk about IPF. It took us almost two years to write this paper. I, I'll never forget it because I was the lead author on the paper and I had, I think, 27 reviews. So he sends it out for peer reviews. The, the peer review response to the manuscript was twice as long as the manuscript. It was one of the most painful experiences I've ever had. But we finally got this paper out and all of us decided that we were, what we're talking about and the words we would use and how we would define the disease. And that really helped change the whole field because we then started thinking that we're talking about the same disease. We got more precise. We weren't, all of it wasn't right, but it completely changed how we thought about it. Then in 2001, we looked at the a multidisciplinary consensus uh, classification for the IPF. And these are three important tables from that paper where we looked at what are we calling idiopathic interstitial pneumonias, how are we using the histo histologic pattern, the clinical radiographic pathologic pattern, uh, and what diagnostic approach. And this was the first time we put HRCT at the center of the evaluation of this disease. Uh, and that, again, changed what we're doing, how we're doing. And then we went after this, idiopathic nonspecific interstitial pneumonia. And here, we asked for all the, all, we went to, we wrote to all authors who had written a paper with NSIP in the title or in the abstract. And we said, send us your, those cases that you wrote about so we can all look at those cases. We got 300 and some patients, who, 300 and some cases that were sent, uh, and mostly from the people listed here as authors. And, um, and we looked at them uh, at the AFIP and came up with a diagnosis. Of the 300 and some patients that we started with, only 15 were in the bullseye of what we called NSIP. And then there were 45 that were right in the next zone outside the bullseye. Um, so we said, we're gonna look at these 60 and see if we can define if this entity actually exists. So then the question is, what were these other cases? And they were connective tissue disease, hypersensitivity pneumonitis, drug and disease, but they were published as idiopathic NSIP. Um, so that helped clarify things and then um, more recently, there have been other uh, been a follow up on IPF uh, where, HS where HRCT was now said to be diagnostic of the UIP pattern, uh, and that has com completely changed things. So, that then allowed, that set us up so we could do these treatment trials. And so, the treatment trials that we, we've done, many of them over time, starting back in the 80s, many trials were done. These were small, underpowered, we probably shouldn't have believed them. Um, then we started doing much larger trials. Um, and if you look at the size of the trial, this is a slide from Luca Ritaldi. But if you look, over a period of time, the, the size of the box is the, is the size of the cohort that was studied. You can see we started studying larger and larger and larger cohorts of patients with IPF. And that then allowed us to get to the point where we have these two trials, the Impulsus trial and the Ascend trial, which, uh, which resulted in the positive result. Interestingly, there were more failures of our randomized trial than is customary in industry trials. And we're not exactly sure why that is, except this is a tough nut to crack, um, probably because the progression is slow. And we didn't find a magic bullet. So what we were doing was slowing progression uh, and trying to improve survival. And the four trials that have, that have been the most important was the Infogenia trial, prednisone, azathioprine, and NAC, the Panther trials, which was prednisone, um, azathioprine, and NAC in one trial, and, and N-acetylcysteine alone in another, the Ascend trial on profenadone, the Impulsus trial on the, the tetanib. So this is an important trial, <coughs> high-dose uh, acetylcysteine 
added to prednisone and azathioprine. It was thought that this, this study showed that that combination of and, and, and acetylcysteine with prednisone and azathioprine slowed the progression of disease compared to placebo. They, these people were progressing, but at a much slower rate on this three-drug regimen. So that became sort of the standard of care for a while. Then we decided to study prednisone, azathioprine, and NAC in the Panther trial and published in 2008. And we were shocked to learn that actually this combination now with a true placebo. So before, it was not a true placebo. It was patients with prednisone, azathioprine, and NAC versus prednisone and azathioprine. There was not a untreated placebo control, control group. Here, untreated patients compared to the treated patients. And what, much to our surprise, and in retrospect, we shouldn't have been, there was an increased risk of death and hospitalization in the patients treated with the combination, prednisone, azathioprine, and NAC, compared to placebo. And had we not done a, com a complete placebo-controlled trial, I think we would have never seen this. Um, and in fact, every th everywhere you look at it, the combination therapy was worse than placebo. Um, by uh, looking at death or disease progression, the combination therapy worse than placebo, looking at uh, time to death as a composite of death or hospitalization, the combination therapy was worse than placebo. So much, much worse outcome if you were on the treatment than if you were on nothing at all. And so that then basically shut down, this is compelling as evidence, that this combination was bad and worse than nothing at all. And so stopping that therapy has been really important. Then having done, the community having stopped that therapy, we did two trials, the INSPIRE trial and capacity trial. And I just want to show you something here. If you look at weeks, this is time, this is patient survival. Classically, when you look at survival in this population, this is a classic study showing that survival at five years was, well, in, this, in this particular study, only 20% of people are alive at five years. Half are dead at around two to three years. But if you look at this population we're studying now, at two years, almost 90% of people are still alive. So the question I ask is, why is it that all of a sudden we stopped using this therapy and now we're finding that in the population of patients we're following, they're alive? I think it's because we were hurting people with a therapy that we thought worked. We have to give them something, and we were giving something bad. And so this is reinforced for me that we have to, as physicians and scientists, remember to do the studies right and that you have to do placebo controlled trials and people want to believe what they want to believe. I believe very strongly that prednisone was, should be used, that we should use it at high dose, that it was a thing to do, and I would just watch these people suffer. And now I know that, that what we were doing was we were hurting patients because we never, I wrote a grant in 1970, 1981, to, and the grant was prednisone, prednisone and cytotoxan versus placebo, three-arm study. Marvin Schwartz and I wrote the grant. The NIH wrote back and said, you cannot do that study, it's unethical to do that study. So for all these years, we hurt people. And it, and it, it just reminds us, we just have to, have to do it right because I think that therapy was bad. Now, we, we looked at randomized acetylcysteine alone, since that was the other drug that people thought added well, would imp with slow progression of the disease. And the bottom line is acetylcysteine doesn't work. It's, it's, it's no better than placebo. Um, and so people still use it because it's pretty benign, um, but, uh, and it's pretty cheap, but it doesn't work. So if you just want to give somebody something, maybe this is okay. Doesn't do anything, good or bad. Um, and, um, and so people will do it out. The, but that was the, the results of the NAC trial. Nintetinib is the new drug. What's fascinating about the drugs that work, we had already studied this class of drug. Imaginative, we studied, is a very specific tyrosine kinase inhibitor. It did not work. This drug, we have no idea how it works. We know it works as a tyrosine kinase inhibitor, but it hits several places in the pathway. And so it's interesting that as we hit several places in the pathway with this drug and profenadone, we don't really know how profenadone works because it hits several paces, places in the pathway from inflammation to fibrosis to scarring. And we think this, that what really worked was by hitting several places in the pathway, then we got a drug, the tetanib, uh, that, that seemed to work in this setting. 
the, the, it's, it's slow progression. If you look at, there were two trials that were identical, done at the same time. The patients who were treated with the active agent had a much slower rate of decline, 114 mLs versus placebo, 239 mLs. So they're still getting worse, but at a, very much, at a much significantly slower rate than the people on placebo. So that's what this trial showed. It also suggested that people, this is just another way of showing the nitetinib group was getting worse, but at a slower rate than placebo in both trials. Um, the, there was, the other thing they looked at was because acute exacerbations are really bad. If you have one, you, you have a high chance of dying afterwards. In one of the trials, it looked like treatment with nitetinib reduced the, the onset of, the, of an acute exacerbation. The other trial, there was no difference. So this may or may not be a useful outcome of, of using that drug, nitetinib. It did not affect mortality, so there was no mortality. Statistically, there was a, a reduction in the treated uh, group compared to placebo, but it wasn't statistically significant. Side effects, diarrhea. Um, that's by far the most, 60% of patients got diarrhea. Most of them were able to continue the medication, but that's the main problem with diarrhea, with uh, that drug. The other trial is the phase three trial of profenadone. Uh, in this trial, what we showed was that, again, the proportion of patients who had a decline of 10% or greater or death. So this combination, either they, they fell 10% or they died. If you look, the, the, placebo, the profenadone treated group in blue here did better than the placebo group. Fewer of those people had one of those two events. Uh, and if you look at the, again, the change in FEC, the profenadone group was getting worse, but much less slowly, more slowly than the placebo group. So it appeared that uh, profenadone slowed progression in this population. And when we looked at the, other, we looked at the risk of death, profenadone in this study seemed to alter the risk of death. You can't look at, this is beyond the, the study. There are very few patients out here, but at the time points we looked at, there were fewer deaths in the profenadone group compared to placebo. So maybe this drug alters survival. It needs to be further studied. Um, and there were other, um, so other uh, uh, endpoints that we looked at, but the bottom line was treatment with profenadone, reduced progression as measured by lung function, six-minute walk test, and survival. Um, and so we think the drug is safe and tolerated. Again, diarrhea, nausea, vomiting is one major side effect, and skin rash, photosensitivity is the other with profenadone. All of those were, we were able to keep patients on the drug um, by altering the dose. So very few people actually were off the drug. So this has led to a new paradigm in how we approach patients with this disease. The goal for a doctor seeing a patient with a disease is to relieve the patient's symptoms in this setting to improve their exercise tolerance and to improve their health status. We need to do a lot of other things to do that. So manage their cough. A lot of these people are, in, are pro, uh, depressed, so managing their press, depression. We've learned that many of them have sleep disturbances, which alters their days, so you have to manage sleep apnea if it's a problem. Pulmonary rehab works, even though these people are severely breathless. We, we've shown in, in randomized trial that pulmonary, have, uh, pulmonary rehab improves their sense of well-being and improves their exercise tolerance, so their, their activities of daily living are better. They just feel better about life, so we recommend peak rehab. Managing GERD, as I said earlier, we are learning that we should control GERD. We've actually shown in studies that patients who had their GERD managed live longer than people who did not. So this is why we're driving down this pattern to see if there's some kind of pathogenetic relationship between GERD and this disease. And supplemental oxygen, we've never studied it, but we think that like in COPD, when you're hypoxemic, if you give somebody oxygen, they'll just feel better and do better. We can't say it improves their survival, but they, they tend to actually be able to carry on their activities of daily living. To treat uh, complications and uh, exacerbations, we need to continue to work to try to find appropriate ways to manage that. To prevent disease progression, we now have two therapies for sure, profenadone and atatinib. There may be in acetylcysteine might be useful, and in advanced disease, I didn't show you this study, but sildenafil seemed to actually improve the quality of life in patients with really, really severe uh, IPF. 
to reduce mortality, um, the, 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 the only thing we have available to reduce mortality is, um, is lung transplant. This works in this setting. We do a lot of them. It's the most common reason for a lung transplant at UCSF, and we do about 60 a year, something like that, with a very high survival rate. Um, so this is an option for patients. When we first, our, the transplant clinic and the IDRLD clinic are held at the same time. So I see a patient, I tell them this bad diagnosis, and they see the transplant doctor uh, usually on the same day. So thank you very much, and I'll entertain any questions. Yes. Do you have any thoughts about uh, why in the early options you have the, the injury is subplural of you? <coughs> no, we thought a, the question was why, why is the disease so focally basal and subplural? And we've thought a lot about it. And people believe it has to do with the breathing, and that the, mechanic, the mechanics of breathing alters the injury and that, and that it occurs at the periphery. Some animal studies suggest that that probably is true. The mechanics have something to do with it, but we don't really understand why. But it's amazingly consistent. Yes. Any, any evidence that treating GERD, even though it's asymptomatic, would alter the course of IPF? No, but we are doing that. So we, we actually now have a randomized trial where the patients, we're doing fundoplication um, to see if it, it prolongs survival. Uh, even in patients who are asymptomatic. The, the truth is, when we started looking for GERD in an asymptomatic IPF patient, we would find it, and it was often very bad, and they had, did not have classic symptoms. So it's, it's relatively common that they don't have the usual things we think of when, in, in this setting. So we, we are treating them all. PPIs are not benign, so we worry about using them, but, but we, we use PPIs to treat them with the idea that we're the data in retrospectoscope, looking at data in the can, what, we, what Joyce has shown is that the patients who were treated aggressively with PPIs have much better survival than those that got no treatment. So there's something there, we think. But remember, I already said, we've got to do the right study. We just have to do the right study. But we think there's something there. Any other? Well, an obvious question here is, I mean, you have two drugs now that, that may help. Which, how do we choose? Okay, start with $90,000. <laughs> That's what it's going to call, eighty to $90,000, okay? And I don't, I don't know. So what, so what we've been arguing about at UCF in the group is that we're going to have a bottle of mar marbles in the room. I've done this before when I was in Denver. Different color marbles, and we just pull out a marble. You get a blue one you're on preventing on, you get a green one you're on attentive. And then we'll see. But, you know, so I'm biased. So I've been working on, I've, I've worked with both companies on both drugs, but I've been involved with five trials with profenadone. It's the most used of all the drugs. It's been studied, it's been used in Europe now for several years. We have almost 10 years of data. So we know more about that drug than we do in the tentative. So my bias is toward that drug, but they paid me a lot of money to say that. So <laughs> take it under advice. So are insurance companies paying for the drug? The answer is we don't really know. Most of them, the answer is they, they have been able to get, find a way to get the drug to the patient. They the companies. So all these drugs, you actually have to sort of go in through the, you, there's, a, there's a system for how you get the drug and they help you get approval for paying. But, for like UIP, will they allow the diagnosis to stop with the high resolution CT or are they asking for the person to go? No, they're not asking for biopsy, but they have to have definite UIP. They have to follow the guidelines that were in the trial. So they're being fairly strict about that. But I can tell you, if patients are getting it, doctors are using it for, for all these patients and patients are getting it from India. You have to be very careful. We've tested some of the drugs, some of the Indian Drugs are very are, are real. They're very they're the real thing, and some are nothing. And so, but there are a couple of sub, couple of companies. The drug is easy to profenadone, easy to make, and uh, and the drug is potent. So people are getting them from from there. Uh, so there there are ways around. 
there's anything that weighs around it. It really is. Have you tried anybody on any of them yet? No, I haven't. Anybody here tried the Jerry, it's very difficult to get approval, yeah. but you can. And the drug is available from Canada. And I have five patients here. Yeah. Yeah. It's going to be easier in the next couple of months. They're, they're, we're working through all of these things. Most of the companies are, are negotiating. The reason it's been really hard, they're negotiating down the price. So, you know, recently the pharmaceutical, the big drug companies have been fighting the pharmaceutical companies over price. And so they're, they're negotiating down the price. It's probably going to be at the same rate as NICE. So one of the things that happened is in, in the, U the UK, NICE actually really uh, uh, um, held their feet to the fire and reduced the price. And I think all these companies are going to make them do it at that price. Because, you know, traditionally in the, in the U.S., the drugs are much cheaper in Europe than they are here. I mean, we are subsidizing drugs all over the world because we pay such a, such a high price. So now, because we can't negotiate, right? Medicare can't negotiate for drug prices as we negotiate. The, I think companies are going to negotiate them to a lower price. Now, whether they'll pass that on to consumers, we would hope so. But I, you know, there are, there are a couple of pills. You drop one of these suckers in the toilet, you're you diving in after it. <laughs> 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 it's, like, it's like going after your beeper. And don't tell me you didn't do that at least once. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. no. Any other questions and comments? Thank you all very much for coming. I really